it's a real treat to have Randy here, and he is uh, he's just a really great guy. I've had a chance to talk with him a few times over the years, and so it's my privilege to invite Randy Cohen to the stage. All right. Thank you. Thanks. You know, that's great kind. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. It's so great to be here. Um, and wow, it's not often that you know you're uh, doing competition with a wine and art walk. So uh, you know, I'm like gauging all the faces here, and I'll be taking roll at the end of this to see who slipped out. But uh, it's great to be back in South Dakota, back at another statewide conference here. I've actually done a couple of these over the years. Did one in Spearfish, like. 15 years ago or something, and then we did one in Chamberlain about a half dozen years ago. I love my visits, love coming back to Sioux Falls here. Uh, this is just a great art city and a great art state. And we got a good news story to talk about today, and that's the arts, the power of the arts, the work that you do, and how when we create the arts, present the arts, connect our communities to the arts, we're building a healthier South Dakota through the arts. And that's what we're going to touch on today. Um, and so, you know what? I've got the, you know, in the big print there, claim your impact. You know, we, and by the end of this, I hope everyone has a better understanding of the work we do, how it's improving our communities. You know, whether it's education, health, the economy, quality of life. And the amazing thing is, you know, we, we've all got great stories about that. There's really some fantastic numbers that underscore all those stories. So, um, Good, we're going to have a good time here today. So uh, I always, you know, before we get into those sort of pragmatic aspects of the arts, we, we, we can never forget the fundamental reason that, you know, we all got into this, you know, and we love the arts. The arts inspire us. They engage us. They make us feel creative. They create the communities that we want to live in and that we want to work in. Arts are a fundamental component of our humanity and a fundamental component of a healthy community. That's the work that you do. And so um, I want to applaud you for that uh, and thank you um, right now for that. Now, arts have been central to our communities, well, for a long, long time. Uh, and as I give you uh, as exhibit A about this, um, this hand-carved flute that was found in a cave in Germany by some anthropologists a couple of years ago. And what was fascinating is these anthropologists were uh, looking at Stone Age cave dwelling civilizations. And, you know, they were trying to figure out, well, what were those folks doing back then? And, you know, wouldn't it be great if we found a, a spoon or a bowl or something like that, learned a little bit about how these folks lived or, or hit the jackpot and found a cave painting or something? Well, what they landed on was this hand carved flute made of animal bone, which they dated to be 35,000 years old. 35,000 year old flute. This was such a big find. It was such an important scientific find. It was actually published and written about in the journal Science, top scientific journal in the world. But what was fascinating in reading this article is they were trying to figure out now what was the purpose of this flute? You know, they thought, well, maybe it was a way to promote territorial expansion. All right, sure, why not? Or, or maybe it was a way to celebrate the hunt, or maybe for, you know, for the fertility ritual, something like that. I kept thinking, maybe they liked the way it sounded. <laughs> that never showed up. Uh, but, you know, the idea, arts, you know, central to our communities have been for a long time. You know, eventually someone got enough guts, like, well, I guess someone should blow some air through this thing, see how it sounds. You know, it sounded great. It had tonality to it and everything. So, um, you know, gave rise to the great pickup line, my cave or your cave. So, you know, a lot went on here. Now, this flute thing really stayed with folks. So we fast forward 35,000 years, the 1700s, where we find the shame flute. Now, this little ditty was made out of cast iron, and that round part you see was actually clasped around a person's neck, and this long iron tube, the fingers were shackled to this tube. The purpose of the shame flute was to punish bad musicians. I'm looking your way, guys. This was not you. You guys, by the way, are fantastic. Thank you. Um, how about a hand for the musicians, our band here? You guys were wonderful. Thank you. I wanted to Get up and start dancing, but we'll do that later. Um, so, you know, you got a gig back then at the Prince's Palace and you stank up the joint. Well, you know, they'd march you around town in the shame flute for a couple of days so everybody could laugh at the bad musician. You know, we talk about cultural tourism. Nothing brings out a crowd like the shame flute. 
So anyway, I like to think we've come a long way since then. Maybe, maybe not. But, you know, art's fundamental component of our humanity, our communities, have been a long time. And, you know, the public really understands this. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I published uh, that public opinion survey that Jim mentioned. Americans speak out about the arts. There's a little bit about that in your packet. And 87% of the American population says the arts improve our quality of life. You know what? The American public really understands this. But what's fascinating is they understand some of the pragmatic benefits of the arts as well. So I wasn't surprised, actually, that 87% said, yeah, arts improve our quality of life, of course. I was a little surprised when 82% of the American population agreed that arts are good for the local economy and good for local businesses. You know, this is a story we've been telling to government leaders for years, and here, 8 in 10, you know, American adults, they get it. So uh, some pretty interesting findings about how the public understands, appreciates, and engages in the arts. Actually, I'm going to drop a few numbers in uh, this along the way, but um, one of the fascinating things in this uh, public opinion survey is how engagement in the arts is changing and evolving. So this was a big study. I did over 3,000 interviews, one of the largest public opinion surveys of the arts ever conducted. And you always start those questionnaires, those surveys with, hey, in the last year, did you go to an arts event? Did you go to the theater? Did you go to a museum? Did you go to a festival? The zoo, the botanical garden, the symphony? 68% of the American population, over two-thirds said yes to at least one of those. And that's been a pretty consistent finding. But I think we all know how engagement in the arts is changing a little bit. You know, people, people are looking for more active kinds of experiences. They're engaging in the arts in different places. So I followed that question up with another one that said, you know, there's a lot of places to uh, experience the arts uh, in your community. Um, in the last year, have you had an arts experience at the airport, in the hospital, in the school, symphony in the park, you know, public art in the built environment, and even larger, 77% of the population said yes to that. So more people are having arts experiences, what I would call a non-arts venue, uh, than our traditional venues. And so that's something I think we need to pay attention. We're going to talk a lot today about, you know, making the case for arts funding and everything. But, you know, as we think about building demand for the arts, uh, you know, the public's letting us in on a little bit of, yeah, you know, we like the arts and we want to experience them in different places. Now, um, I always have, you know, what I call my USA Today question, you know, because, yeah, okay, those questions help us see how engagement's changing and all that stuff. So I thought, hmm, what would get published in USA Today? So I asked the American public, do you have a tattoo? So uh, I won't look for hands here. But you know what? One in four Americans have one or more tattoos. So uh, about 25%. Uh, then I asked everybody, do you think tattoos are art? 74% said some or all tattoos are art. Wasn't that interesting? So, um, you know, while only a quarter of the population has a tattoo, three quarters of the population says, yeah, that's an art. Uh, so interesting how people are connecting uh, to the arts in different ways. So um, lots more we can talk about that. Uh, we'll hit some of those uh, public opinion points, uh, you know, engagement things as we go along. But I want to get now to some of these pragmatic benefits. You know, again, we talked about those intrinsic fundamental benefits. I want to stipulate that and talk about some of the benefits that come to the community. Now, about a year ago, uh, we had a conference call, um, which Jim was on, actually. We had all the state arts advocacy uh, directors um, in the United States on a conference call. And on the call, we had U.S. Senator Tom Udall. He's the senator from New Mexico. And remember, a year ago, the White House had just put out a budget that zeroed out federal support for arts and culture. And, you know, Senator Udall, who co-chairs the Senate Cultural Caucus and is chief sponsor of the CREATE Act, which is going to push creation, you know, creativity and design across the federal agencies, he was talking about how great the arts are. Finally, someone said, you know, Senator, um, we're glad you appreciate it, but how do you make the case for the arts in this environment that we're in? And without missing a beat, he said, tell every one of your senators about the economic benefits of the arts. Well, all right, he's an you know, accomplished senator, so um, that's what we're going to talk about a little bit here for a minute. You know, uh, if that's what our elected leaders need to hear, well, then let's learn how to talk, uh, you know, learn what our economic impact data is. So um, arts and economic prosperity. 
That is a study we published last June. It's a national study of nonprofit arts and culture organizations and their audiences. Um, we had 341 study communities from across the country. You can see there we are, Sioux Falls. Everybody catch this technical effect? That was all me, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Oh, the Black Hills region. We studied a number, of, a couple communities and regions um, in South Dakota as well. So I actually got to go to an arts event recently. Uh, you know, I think with Americans for my, are the arts on my business card, he must be going to the arts all the time. Lucky. Have as much trouble getting out the door as the next guy. But uh, um, it was date night with my wife. Uh, and a little bit about myself, newly an empty nester. Um, any of you who are on the cusp of this are in for glorious times ahead, I can tell you. So um, we have become, with our new free time, ballroom dancers. Uh, we have taken up ballroom dancing, uh, so uh, which has been fabulous. And if you're here next Friday over at the Shrine, uh, they got monthly ballroom dance right here in Sioux Falls. So I wish I was staying another week because I'd be there with it. Um, so I, we had heard, usually when we were going out to the arts, we'd go to the theater or museum or something, but we heard about this fantastic tango performance that was going to take place. And so we thought, let's do it. You know, let's go see some tango. So we went home and got on the computer and found the theater and, you know, got the right performance and everything and pulled out the credit card, punched in the numbers and printed out the tickets, you know, love the e-commerce, right? You know, so we were all set to go in two Fridays. Date night was on. So that Friday comes and uh, I got home from work and I learned that we'd be dressing up this evening. So on went the suit. But uh, um, waiting for me was a new necktie. So that was good. So this whole economic impact of the arts thing hadn't even started yet. There's already some retail spending involved. Um, so uh, on the way to the theater, we stopped and had dinner, right? Isn't that something we do a lot? Dinner and a show. And so uh, we had a nice dinner, spent about 75 bucks. And, uh, and then from there, was back in the car and off to the theater. We parked in the parking garage next door, peeled off my 10 bucks, gave it to the guy, got my stub, and then we went into the theater itself. It's one of those um, uh, beautifully preserved historic, renovated historic theaters. And so, you know, the, the gilded ceilings and the frescoes on the wall and everything. So we walked around. It was beautiful. We got our programs and sat in the auditorium and read all about the dancers and the performance and, you know, admired the beautiful chandeliers hanging down. And we were all ready to go. Now, it's only five minutes to eight, right? So the performance hasn't even started yet. But think about all the industries that have already been touched related to just this one date night at the arts. We're not even to the dancers yet or the performance yet. Because it started, you know, two weeks before when we got home and went online and, you know, found the right uh, theater and the performance. Arts organizations employ web designers and computer programmers. And we bought our tickets, right, with a credit card. So now you got the finance people and the e-commerce people involved. And then, you know, um, I don't know where my wife bought the necktie, but, you know, it was a cool Frank Lloyd Wright one. So uh, yeah, that cost something. So, you know, that, that organ company benefited. Um, and then we went out to dinner, right? We spent 75 bucks. It's one of those farm to fork places, you know, so everything's grown within 50 miles. So some of the uh, $75 is going to the local growers and producers of the food. And the waiters bring home some personal income, the owner of the restaurant, some entrepreneurial income. And then, you know, it was off to the parking garage you know, to park the car. That happens to be a municipally owned parking garage. And I can tell you, that, you know, the city is making bank on that theater, you know, 500 seats. And that's where most of the people park, 10 bucks, 10 bucks, 10 bucks, night after night. So, um, and then again, you know, we went into the theater and ever notice when you go to an arts event, we're always giving people paper, right? Uh, you know, it's a program or it's a whole folder of stuff, you know, here for the conference. Well, there's a writer in the community that's paid to do the writing of that program. And there's a graphic artist that's paid to do the design. And there's printers. Printers do so well by our organizations, right? You know, because we're always, it's full color, it's glossy, it's thousands of programs. And there's another company that does the delivery. So. Anytime you, you know, if you just want to think of one thing, think of that program and just remind people just that program, all the different industries that it touches in a community. And then sitting in the audience, and I used to run a theater, and I could tell you those beautiful chandeliers, 
Those are not interns changing those light bulbs. You know, you got to get electricians up there to do that work. So arts organizations employ the trades, electricians and plumbers and accountants and auditors and marketing people. So 8 o'clock comes, the curtain goes up, the performance begins. That's when people start to think, maybe start to think about arts as an industry. You know, wow, those dancers are amazing. I bet they're getting paid something, you know. So uh, uh, poor dancers, it's a hard go. Um, so, you know, that whole experience, spending by the arts organizations, um, on the artistry, on their facilities, on utilities, on all the different businesses throughout the community, Plus, that event-related spending by arts audiences on dinner and barking and babysitting and all those other kinds of expenses, that's what we're looking to capture in this Arts and Economic Prosperity Study. Everyone good with that? All right. You know, that's what we did. That's what we're looking for. So again, big national study, 341 study regions, all 50 states. We studied communities as small as 1,500 people, as large as 4 million. It doesn't matter if you're in a small rural community, a large urban city. If the arts are happening there, there is a measurable economic impact. And again, we only focus on nonprofit arts and culture organizations. Why? Well, when the state or our municipalities or our businesses in, you know, support the arts, those dollars are typically going to nonprofit organizations. And it's an appropriate question to ask. All right, yeah, we get quality of life, but what's the public getting in return economically for that investment? So that's, uh, that's why we take a look at that. We take a very conservative approach to economic impact. Right here in the city of Sioux Falls, we surveyed 49 organizations, heard back from 26 of them. That's all we go with. We only use data from the organizations that provide it. We you know, don't make estimates for non-respondents. So all the numbers I'll talk about, and I'll give the Sioux Fall numbers you know, just to sort of you know, tell the story and the narrative. But these are dollars we can put our hands on in every community. So what do we find out? Well, just right here in Sioux Falls, nonprofit arts and culture industry, $104.6 million industry. And you can see that number is comprised of two separate figures. The one on the left, spending by the organizations, $20.1 million. That's just those 26 responding organizations. Again, we got the dollars. You know, we're not making you know, wild estimates or anything like that. And then those 26 organizations had combined, combined attendance of 2.5 million people. To figure out the audience spending piece, we did 702 audience surveys where we went to a whole range of arts events, and we asked folks, hey, we're so glad you're here. Listen, can you do a quick survey? How much did you spend on food, on you know, all the things we talked about, right? So um, we found the typical attendee in Sioux Falls spends $34.41 per person per event, not including the cost of admission. So we'll dive a little deeper on that in just a second. But you pack all that up, that's how you get that, uh, that total of $104.6 million of economic activity. So that right there is a story. Arts organizations, they're more than just you know, amenities for the community. They're businesses. They employ people locally. They purchase goods and services in the community. They're members of the Chamber of Commerce. They drive tourism. Arts organizations are good business citizens, and we have to remember just to tell that very basic story as well, because it's not intuitive. People just don't think about the arts that way. So just that $20.1 million right there is an important story to tell. All right, what's the economic impact of that? Well, to figure out the economic impact of that activity, we work with a team of economists who customize what's called an input-output analysis model for every community that we study. You're all eating. I don't want anybody to choke to death, so I'm not going to get too deep into this. But imagine your worst calculus nightmare. That's what these economic models start to look like. It takes a million calculations for every community to come up with its findings. Here's what you need to know. All of these are very localized models. That's because 50 bucks spent here in Sioux Falls is going to have a different economic impact than 50 spent in Rapid City, than 50 spent in you know, Boise, than 50 spent in Denver. So very localized findings. So what do we find out? The first thing we look at is jobs. Ask any legislator, what are your three priorities? They'll tell you. 
jobs, jobs, and jobs. You know, how do we create more jobs? How do we get higher paying jobs? How do we attract and retain, you know, better jobs? So we're connecting what's important to them to our cultural product. Right here in Sioux Falls, 3,535 jobs supported as a result of that economic activity. And here's the other thing about the jobs we support. These are very localized jobs. You know, these aren't the kind that are offshore. If we go to the symphony, you know, we're not going to be happy if it's a first violinist and 99 Macintosh computers, right? You know, I mean, you know, we need more than, you know, just one musician and a bunch of technology. We, the arts aren't just, are not going to benefit for those kind of efficiencies because that's what makes the arts experience great. And that's why those jobs are reliable and stay right in the community. So the way I always talk about this, you know, the arts, yeah, they're food for the soul, but they're also putting food on the table for 3,535 households right here in the Sioux Falls area. All right, what's another thing we look at? Government revenue. You know what? Eight and a half million dollars in state and local government revenue as a result of just the nonprofit arts sector here in Sioux Falls. Uh, about two thirds of that's state, uh, about a third of that's municipal, uh, city and county dollars. And this is important because what it shows is that when the public supports the arts, it's not a one way street. You know, those dollars aren't being poured down some black hole of goodness. You know, it's giving back to the community economically, jobs, government revenue, as well as quality of life. So a really good news story. And again, and I'll just a second, I'll tell you how to estimate your own economic impact if you weren't part of this study. But first, let me drill it down to really the value added aspect of this. And that's the audience spending. Remember $34.41 per person. And you can see how that spending breaks down. You know, on the left there, you got meals and snacks and then, you know, souvenirs and gifts. There's my necktie and, you know, ground transportation. That's my parking. So you might be looking at lodging. <laughs> wow, can you still get a room here for $3.90? You know, and, and would you want it if you could get it? You know, no, you probably wouldn't, right? Um, so uh, not everybody has, that's an average, not everybody has a lodging expense. Nationally, we did 212,000 audience surveys. I was just up in Wisconsin and other was always a sort of an interesting catch-all category, but there was a farmer in Wisconsin who paid somebody $60 to milk his cows so he could go to the theater that night. Isn't that great? People are doing what it takes to get to the arts. And so those are all the stories we capture. Now, in addition to how much did you spend at this arts event, we also asked folks for their zip code. Because we want to find out, do they live in the county in which the arts event took place? Are they local? Or are they from outside the county? So right here, 49% of attendees come from outside of Minnehaha County. Almost half of the attendees. That's amazing. That is well above the national average. So, um, and then do they spend differently? You bet they do. $44.49 uh, per person, right? So more on travel, more on food. That's where we see the lodging uh, costs show up. Um, so we asked those folks yet another question because we're just that annoying. You know, when will these people stop and leave me alone? So, because we asked those non-local attendees a really simple question. Why are you here? We're glad you're here. Thank you for coming, but are you here on business or are you here visiting friends and family? 62% said we came specifically for this arts event. So you can really now see the pulling power of the arts. And then we asked the local folks who do live in the county, let's say this arts event wasn't taking place. Would you have stayed home, done something else? We gave them a bunch of options. 32%, so about a third said, we traveled to a different community to attend a similar kind of arts event. So what this tells us is that when we invest in the arts, we're investing in culture and creativity and beauty and joy, but we're also investing in a product that brings people to the community and those folks spend money. Not only that, we're keeping our neighbors and their hard-won discretionary dollars right here in town. And that's why we say a vibrant arts community is good for local merchants. It's putting cheeks and seats and derrieres and cafe chairs and um, heads and beds. So remember I was telling you the lodging costs? So nationally, right, locally, right, two and a half million attendees, 
49% from outside the county, and 13% of those folks had a lodging cost. They average $122 per person per event. So, you know, you get that head in the bed. That's when the cash registers really start ringing. So your economic development people, your tourism people love these numbers. So this is a really great story. Everyone follow me so far? Everyone good with this? Good. All right. Now, here's one of the um, great things about this uh, as well. When you, uh, um, if you go to the, you know, website of the, uh, uh, the Arts Council here, the uh, 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 South Dakotans, um, uh, the state uh, gyms organization. You know, you see the report, it looks kind of like that. And it's got all the numbers in it. But if you flip to the back and also give you the website, you're going to see a bunch of logos of our national partners. And it looks like this. So Washington, D.C., that's where I'm from. Yeah, I usually start by just apologizing for that at the outset. But, uh, um, you know, that's the case. But it's the land of national organizations. You know, there's so many national organizations in Washington. There's actually a national organization for the national organizations. So, you know, but you can actually make this work for you because um, you see partners on this project like the U.S. Conference of Mayors. That's where all the, you know, the mayors get together a couple times a year to caucus about mayoral issues. And uh, the League of Cities, National Association of Counties. We've got our, you know, National Conference of State Legislatures, uh, our partners on this. Destinations International, that's where the uh, tourism people go. Um, if you're a, mem a city manager, uh, you belong to the International City County Management Association, and every month you get your public management magazine, the October cover story, your arts and economic prosperity study. You know, and so um, it's sort of our top-down, bottom-up strategy. So we're giving you the tools to make the economic case for the arts, but we've got this national organization talking to the nation's city managers and saying, Focus on the arts. It's good for quality of life. It's good for the economy. Um, and so it's really a great way to um, demonstrate the power of the arts. And what this, you know, these organizations are partners because, one, they too believe arts are a fundamental component of a healthy community. And two, they buy into the methodology, they buy into the results. Trust me, if they thought this thing was going to stink down the road, you know, they're not going to get near it. So um, another real benefit of this study. So, all right, if, you know, you're in the Black Hills region, there's a great uh, economic impact study there, $114 million industry, and, you know, there's those findings. Or if you're here in Sioux Falls or Sioux Falls area, you've got a study. But what if you're in a community that didn't do an economic impact? Well, you can go to our Arts and Economic Prosperity Calculator, and the website's there at the bottom, americansforthearts.org slash economic impact. This thing is as easy as falling off a log. You pick a population category, you put in an organizational expenditure and uh, an attendance figure if you've got it, hit calculate, and all those boxes at the bottom will populate with your economic, estimated economic impact of your nonprofit arts industry. So, uh, you know, this way we got a tool here for everybody to use. So that's the nonprofit arts industry's economic impact. It's a fabulous story, and I got to tell you, um, you know, it goes back to what Senator Udall uh, told us, uh, and we've heard from legislators again and again and again. We need the political coverage. We need to hear about the economic benefits as well as the quality of life benefits. Now, I want to expand the lens a little bit, right? Because we know nonprofit arts. It's just a portion of the whole industry, you know? I mean, this study, our study didn't include, you know, the Hollywood motion picture industry or, you know, a lot of these, you know, individual artists or the university theater department, you know, all a fundamental, important part of our cultural ecology. Well, we've been doing economic impact studies for over 20 years, and I did the first one in 94, but now the United States government, the U.S. Department of Commerce, is involved in this whole area of research. And so, um, the Bureau of Economic Analysis now publishes what's called the Arts and Cultural Production Satellite Account. And what that means is they have, you know, they put like, they spread the entire U.S. economy out on a table, you know, and they pull out every little bit that is arts and culture. So nonprofit, for profit, import, export, film, individual artists, university art departments, anywhere they can find arts and culture. Um, uh, happening in the country. If there's an arts dollar moving, they pounce on it like a kitten. So they found in 2015, the
the arts and culture in this country, $764 billion industry. That is billion with a B. That is 4.2% of the nation's economy. That's a bigger share of the economy than agriculture, bigger share of the economy than tourism, than transportation. And it really, um, I just tell you, it amazed the folks at Commerce so much so that they had we better go back and rework this just to be sure. And so they took lots of public comment from economists everywhere, and, and they took the economists in a pot of black coffee and locked them in a room and don't come out till you get it right, slam, you know, and uh, they redid it and actually came back bigger this time. So um, this is really top drawer stuff. Well, now for the first time, they're publishing statewide versions of this. And right here in South Dakota, um, all arts and culture, $1.2 billion dollar economy just right here in the state that is two and a half percent of the state's economy so um, some really phenomenal numbers uh, which are again available from the US Bureau of Economic Analysis now staying with the Washington thing and uh, all these federal agencies the US Department of Agriculture uh, and the NEA recently published a study where they were studying rural communities and economic development and arts and innovation here's what they found in rural communities that have a high, uh, a large number of performing arts organizations, that correlated with innovative businesses and innovative economies. Um, a high preponderance of, you know, creative economy businesses, technology, research, uh, you know, engineering. So where there's arts, there's innovation economically. So one more really phenomenal finding, uh, you know, for the arts. So um, that's the importance of uh, innovation. That's a, a big story. And so let me kind of move on a little bit. You know, there's a lot of economy for this late in the evening. So you all did great with that. Um, and so what you're looking at now is World War II tank. Well, it's actually World War II era tank. But this actually is an inflatable tank. And you can see there in the upper left, um, this is from World War II era. It's a product of the 23rd Special Troops Unit, um, nicknamed the Ghost Army. So, you know, close your eyes, imagine World War II, right? The, you know, the war in Europe. It was real touch and go, you know, and the U.S. military was looking for any possible edge that they could find. And someone got the idea, you know, if we were able to create some battlefield diversions or some misdirection to throw the enemy off a little bit, that might help. So they thought, great idea. And so who do you do? You know, who do you find? You go get the artists, the artists, the designers, the writers, all the creatives, um, Art Kane, Ellsworth Kelly, Bill Blass, so many, you know, the fashion designers, so many of our World War II era artists and designers were all members of the 23rd Special Troops Unit. And their job was to fake out the enemy. Uh, they did things like they had actors go to restaurants that were known to be frequented by spies, you know, and, you know, they dress up and maybe speak a little too loudly about, boy, when Patton goes south, there's going to be trouble, you know. So, uh, or um, uh, one of the U.S. Um, uh, generals credits the 23rd with saving 10,000 American lives during a Rhine War battle because um, it peeled off this huge portion of the German army that went to chase down the inflatable tanks and the inflatable airplanes, you know. And my point is, you know what, if we could use arts and creativity and innovation on a World War II battlefield, boy, we sure can use it right here in modern-day Sioux Falls or across the state in South Dakota. And creativity and innovation um, in the business world these days really is king. Uh, and so I want to tell you a little bit now about um, this study called Ready to Innovate. And it's done by an organization called the Conference Board. Conference Board, they're based in New York, uh, New York. That is the national organization for big business in this country. It's where all the Fortune 1000 corporate, you know, corporate CEOs, that's where they get their information. And what the Conference Board research shows is that creativity is now among the top five applied skills that business leaders are looking for. In fact, it's leapfrog the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. Now, of course, we talk about that as researchers. Well, yeah, of course, you gotta be able to read, write, and do math. But if you can take some creativity and apply it to your scientific, your engineering, your programming knowledge, 
those are the high paying jobs we all want in our communities. 72% of business leaders say creativity is of high importance. 85% of the, for those folks say we're having trouble finding the people we're looking for. And so conference board followed up. All right, well, okay, we hear you. Creativity is important. You know, there's no typing test for creativity. So how do you know if you got a creative on the line? You know, how do you know if one's sitting across the table from you? And so the two biggest indicators of creativity, starting your own business, so entrepreneurial activity, and study of the arts, especially while in college. And at Americans for the Arts, we have a business committee for the arts. It's got, you know, about, uh, it's got 30 Fortune 500 CEOs talking about the importance of arts and culture or communities. And, you know, we're trying to get businesses to, you know, keep investing in the arts. And um, they talk now that uh, the importance of creative talent. And the proxy question for that is, tell us about how you're engaged in the arts. Talk to me about you and the arts. Do you do you, or you participate personally? Do you like to attend? Um, so there's really some connection uh, between that. And um, the co they write in the conclusion of this report, remember, business scholars writing for business leaders, it's clear that the arts, you know, music, drawing, drama, dance, literature, media, provide skills sought by employers of the third millennium. And this is the big issue for business leaders these days. You know, elected leaders, they love jobs, 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 right? And everybody likes a strong economy. But the business world, it's about attraction and retention of talent. And, you know, all those cities, you know, Jim was talking about, I, I got to tell you, the thing I hear so often when I go to a community is our number one export, highly educated young people. I mean, in this economy, ouch, right? You know, because this is a knowledge economy. If innovation's king, you know, we need creative people who can innovate. And, you know, this study connects arts to creativity. And so the workforce has really changed a, a bit these last few years. You know, when I got out of college, you know, I, I went to wherever the job was. I'd take whoever would have me. I packed up a 64 Dodge Dart with the punch button automatic, and, you know, <laughs> that's where I went. But workers in the new economy behaving very differently. They're picking the communities that they want to live in, moving there, and then figuring they'll make it work. This is a domestic phenomenon. It's an international phenomenon. And so these communities that are hemorrhaging young talent, you know, are like, wait, before you go, you know, we raised you, we educated you, we loved you, and now you're leaving us, you know, never to come back again. What would keep you here? And it's the same answer again and again. Look, you want me to be creative in the workplace. I'm a creative person. I need arts and culture in my community. I want arts and maker spaces so I can be personally involved in arts making. Um, you know, great restaurants and a cool downtown, right? I mean, who doesn't want all of that? So um, this is another one of the benefits that we're getting uh, is we're attracting the creative workers. And if that's where the workers are, that's where the businesses go. Because these days, you know, it's all you need is an electrical outlet and room for the satellite dish. You're good to go. You can go to Iowa. You can go to Ireland. doesn't really matter. You're going to bring your company to where the talent goes. And i got to tell you, I was in uh, 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 not long ago in uh, Houston um, where I was hearing an interesting story. I was talking to the Greater Houston Partnership, and that's like the Chamber of Commerce Economic Development Organization for the region. And one of the folks after we were talking about this said, who was a little skeptical initially, but said, well, Governor Perry had said in a speech that the reason we lost the Boeing headquarters to Chicago is because we couldn't keep up culturally. I thought, oh, my God, let this be true. You know, it's like, that's so going in the act. Um, and uh, you can actually go online and you can see Governor Perry's speech and his prepared remarks. He wasn't even, you know, sort of riffing or anything like that. And he talked about, you know, it was the DFW area, all the great arts and culture, which is there, but the Boeing executives made it clear that the key for them to attracting top executive talent is creative, culturally vibrant communities. And, you know, among the finalists, that tipped them to Chicago. So this has real world ramifications. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's the big takeaway there. Um, and so what are some ways to measure that? Well, one way we do that, you know, what's the creative economy in my community? How do we document that? So I do a study um, every other year called Creative Industries, Business and Employment in the Arts. And what I do is I look at nonprofit and for-profit arts businesses nationally. So nationally, 
4% of the nation's arts uh, business establishments are arts-centric businesses. Nonprofit theaters, museums, ballet companies, as well as for-profit, film, architecture, design, publishing. Businesses involved in the creation or the distribution of the arts. And I use as my data source on that, Dun & Bradstreet. It's the most comprehensive and trusted source for business information in the United States. You know, they track 16 and a half million business establishments. And, you know, a few years back, I thought, I wonder if we could figure out how many of those are arts businesses. And, you know, I kind of shinnied up, and they said, well, for this big a pile of money, we'll figure that out. And so I raised it, and that's what we did. And so I can tell you, nationally, about 675,000 businesses are arts, uh, are arts businesses, 4% of all businesses nationally. But then I can drill down to any geographic or political region in the country. And so right here, you see, there's the state, right? South Dakota, and they, all those little dots might be a little hard to see, but 1,352 arts businesses across the state. That's 2.4% of uh, all the business establishments here in the state. We can... Um, Drill down more locally. So here we are, Minnehaha County. Uh, we got 372 uh, arts business establishments. Uh, that's 3.6% of all the business establishments here in the county. So it's a way to track this um, over time. And uh, here's a, our website again, because I have got 11,000 of these reports online. Now everybody got, uh, you know, a state one in your. Uh, your packet. So um, I've got one for all 3,143 counties in this country, all 7,400 state legislative districts, every state legislator. Next time you go to pair uh, and advocate for the arts, print out your map. It's right here, americansforthearts.org slash creative industries. And it's got very specific numbers. It's got state numbers. Again, you know, big cities, I, all of it, 11,000 of these things online. And again, a very conservative approach. Um, you know, I don't use medical research. I don't use computer programmers, all of which are creative, but not arts focused, right? Actually, you know, uh, I was sharing these data with some economists uh, uh, some time back, and uh, uh, you should thank me. I hang out with these folks, so you don't have to. Um, and uh, one of them says, well, um, a question about who was part of your study. Did you include morticians? It's like, uh, no, but bring it. Maybe I'm missing something here. And he said, well, aren't morticians actually involved as presenters of the body? Uh, you know, using lighting and makeup and a, and a new, you know, suit for costuming. And he never looked as good alive as he does today, you know. So there's no morticians in these data. So, again, you can feel really confident, conservative, arts-only businesses. So one other way that you've got local data, this is a tool you can put to work right away about the creative industries in your community. And here's what this looks like in real life. So um, I've got a uh, medical research background as well as an arts background. And I used to work at Stanford University. Um, and so this happy looking fella, Thomas Sudoff, in 2013, he got the Nobel Prize um, for medicine. And the reporter called him up, congratulations, professor. And you know, it's really exciting. And um, asked, who was your, uh, who's your most influential teacher? And without missing a beat, he said, I owe it all to my bassoon teacher. And he went on to explain how his music education growing up gave him the habits of mind that made him a great scientist. Perseverance, pattern recognition, ability to deal with ambiguity, problem solving, doing it again and again and again and again, right? You know, uh, I mean, you know, that's the music training. And the research suggests that's not an anomaly. Uh, there's a Michigan State uh, scholar named Robert Root Bernstein who spent his whole career studying creativity. And what he did is, um, over the years, he and his team, they looked at all the Nobel laureates in the sciences and their level of arts engagement and arts involvement, and he compared those uh, scientists to scientists at, at two separate scientific societies, one in the U.S., one in the U.K., he found the Nobel laureates 17 times more likely to be involved in the arts as arts maker, as painter, uh, as musician. So, you know, there's something to this, uh, you know, about the importance of the arts and, and how they connect us, um, which really gets us next to another important issue facing our communities, education. 
So, um, you know, on this uh, tour I did, you know, I was in 75 cities between in J June and January. So, you know, got to hear from a lot of people and hear some very interesting stories. Um, I was with the Chattanooga folks, uh, and uh, they were um, talking with the, uh, the arts people and the principal uh, of a school there. And they were telling a story about a high school student who was not thriving at all at the high school. You know, not doing well, disengaged you know, problematic, trouble in the classroom. And, you know, the teachers, a lot of the staff and the faculty had just kind of given up. You know, it's like, let's just see if we can get through this. Well, the principal thought, you know, we got to do more to get to this young person. And so um, at one time he was back in the office, I guess, you know, for a disciplinary issue. And he said, you know what, um, our th uh, the, th the student play, um, we need somebody to work the follow spot uh, at the play. And I want you to do it and I need you to do it, and you better do it. And so he convinced this student, it's like, all right, fine, I'll do it. It's probably what I need to do to keep going here. And um, he showed up to rehearsal, and he you know, went all the time. He did the follow spot for that play, for a couple of more plays, and the faculty actually noticed improvements. That wasn't a miraculous 180 turnaround, but you know what? The attitude got better, the academic performance got a little bit better, and everybody noticed that there was some improvement. This young person was just much more engaged with the school and his environment. And at the end of the school year, the principal, you know, met him in the hallway and said, this is great, I'm so glad you took this on, and I hope we can count on you next year to run that follow spot as well. And the student said, no, you know what? Not doing it next year. The principal thought, ah, you know, so close. And the student said, next year I want to be on the stage. I want to be part of that production. Absolutely. Isn't that great? This is what arts education does. It engages people, you know, it engages these students. And for so many, this is the reason they go to school. You know, uh, you talked about that youth arts project I did, you know, years ago with the Department of Justice, looking at you know, some of the programs were, you know, dropout prevention and gang diversion programs. And so there was these fabulous after-school programs for middle schoolers, working with professional artists, real artists, writers, choreographers, actors, painters, and learning the discipline that comes with arts learning, learning the stick to the perseverance. But here's the thing. The students had to show up to school that day in order to participate in the arts program after class. And the principal of that school was not a big fan of this uh, project initially because he was like, wait, you're going to take my worst students and keep them here for more hours in the day? And he was imagining, you know, broken sinks, more defaced lockers. But what he started to notice that, A, that didn't happen, but B, um, his attendance rates were going up and his budget was based in part on cheeks and seats, kids showing up to school. And so uh, he became a huge champion for these arts programs, uh, you know, working with young people. So there's so many fabulous stories, and I'm sure there's a lot of them right here. But the research also demonstrates that all students are performing better academically when they are engaged in the arts. So there's a researcher, James Catterall, um, at UCLA, who unfortunately passed away last summer, but for, you know, years has been doing longitudinal research on uh, students and the ben what happens when they're engaged in the arts. And what he did is he took department, you know, national data from the Department of Education, 25,000 students at 1,000 schools across the country, and he divided those students into four quartiles based on their level of arts involvement. So, you know, up here, practices violin three hours a day or something like that, and you kind of work your way down, you know, maybe gets to a museum once a year or something, and he compared the academic performance. And what he found is the arts-involved students better grade point averages, better standardized test scores, lower dropout rates, better academic performance. Now, he anticipated the question that some of you might be thinking about right now. Oh, that's great, but yeah, you know, aren't some of these kids probably from better educated, more affluent families? You know, you'd expect them to do better, right? So he controlled for that. He went back to his base of 25,000 students and looked at the lowest socioeconomic quartile. So students in Title I uh, schools, low-income communities, and he did the same analysis. And not, he found not only did the results hold, but there was an even greater disparity between the arts-involved and the non-arts-involved kids, helping scholars then think, you know, um, maybe the arts help students catch up who got a late start, help level the playing field. And in fact, um, uh, Dr. Catterall studied those students into their 20s. And even as young adults, 
there was noticeable, measurable differences between the arts-involved students and the non-arts-involved. You know, more likely to have higher college-going rates, more likely to be in career-oriented jobs. So really powerful research, right, that cuts across all socioeconomic strata. Now, put that right over here. Because every 10 years, the US Department of Justice looks at how much arts education is actually out there. And you know what they've seen over the last few decades, probably what a lot of us have seen, well, it's kind of gone down a bit. But in the last um, uh, two studies, they found those students in uh, low-income communities in Title I schools, it wasn't like this, like everybody else. They had a huge drop-off. They were significantly more likely to lose their arts education. And so the students who stand to benefit the most are the ones losing it the fastest. And the Secretary of Education, fast one, called this a civil rights issue because it was so important because it, you know, what you do now is just tracks these young people all throughout their lives. So it's really important. Uh, and that's why arts education is such an important issue. And I, I know a lot of you are involved in it. And so I want to thank you for that and keep pushing on this all the time. I think it's just one of the most uh, important things that we can be doing. Um, let me talk about, and I, you know, I just want to hit a couple of key areas. Uh, healthcare, right? This is all over the newspapers. Uh, you know, an issue all the time. What? Do the arts really have something to do even with healthcare? Well, actually, they do. Um, so I've got an arts background, a theater background. I also have a medical research background. Uh, I worked at Stanford University. I worked at Scripps Clinic and Research Foundation. When I worked at Scripps, um, every Tuesday at 3 o'clock, we used to have live chamber music in the lobby. And, you know, I thought, oh, well, that's, that's kind of a nice amenity and everything. And we had a beautiful lobby with architecture, and they'd turn the fountain down, and patients could walk in, or they'd be wheeled in, and family would join them, and caregivers could be there as well. And it was amazing. Four musicians completely transformed the environment, you know, once they started playing. What I started to notice is that patients that I would see clinically in the rooms lethargic, depressed, you know. I mean, even if you have a view of the ocean, you don't want to be in the hospital, right? You could see physical transformation in people. Their eyes got less cloudy. Posture got better. You could sense, you know, there was just a, a greater awareness of the environment around them. I used to think, something's happening here, you know. It's like they're getting, a, uh, you know, an IV drip of the arts or a shot of something, you know. And well, there's this growing body of research now that shows when the arts are part of our healing, we have sh you know, shorter hospital stays, fewer doctor visits, um, less depression, less medication, and even evidence that it saves money. So I was in Tallahassee, just to give you an example, and the uh, hospital there was dealing with pediatric CAT scans. All right, if you ever had a CAT scan, you know you're in this room with this giant machine. It's noisy, it's scary, you feel claustrophobic. And then you got these squirmy kids, right? You know, so this is a total oil and water mixture here. Well, um, you know, they were trying to figure out, uh, you know, how can we, kids have a high retest rate, you know, which ties up the machine, it's expensive. So you got to give them some kind of sedative or something to relax, even a general anesthetic, because you got to get the picture, right? So they thought, is there a better way to do this? And they decided, let's try a music intervention. And, you know, about an hour before the procedure, they gave the kids a little light, something to relax. But then a harpist or a guitarist came in, played music, talked with the young person. That reduced the stress, the anxiety, and worked to the tune of a 98% procedural success rate and saved an average of $567 per procedure on anesthesiology time, nursing time, medicine, what a great win, right? One more way that the arts are benefiting our communities. We're creating opportunities for musicians. You know, we're getting our kids, you know, to be able to take less medication. We're reducing health care costs. Um, so, you know, really, really powerful findings. And this isn't even a new idea. You know, the God Apollo, um, you know, the God Apollo was the God of both music and healing. Talk about a big portfolio, that guy had it, right? So, uh, you know, we're just sort of reclaiming these ideas um, about how we can build healthier communities through the arts. Um, I was in Gettysburg uh, not long ago, and um, if you've been there, it's a great community to visit, and, you know, fabulous visitor center, the battlefield. But there's a phenomenal story um, that took place just a little south of there, uh, near the Rappahannock River. 
And so it was a cold, cold winter day in the Civil War, you know. Um, and the encampment, the armies were uh, across the Rappahannock River, you know, the north on one side, the south on the other. And so, you know, the bands were really important back then. And the band on the north played a song to sort of cheer up morale. And, you know, everybody kind of sang along at the end. You know, they all clapped and everything like that. And then um, the uh, south, their band, played the same song. And, like, and then all their guys cheered. It's like, you know, and back and forth it went all day long, each trying to, you know, outplay the other and cheer louder than the other until the end of the evening when one of them started playing Home Sweet Home and the other picked up at the exact same time. And everybody cheered at once because there was no fighting that day. They were all together. They were far from home. And the music pulled everybody together. The music unified all the people out there on the battlefield that day. And that's something that the arts do as well. Um, that public opinion survey I talked about, uh, you know, 70, 7 in 10 uh, people say, you know, the arts um, help elevate me beyond my everyday issues. They make me feel better about my today, more optimistic about my tomorrow. But 67% of the population says, the arts unify our communities, regardless of age, race, or ethnicity. Two-thirds of the population says, the arts help me understand other cultures in my community. And what's fascinating is, remember I told you it was a huge study, we did 3,000 interviews. Those findings cut across all socioeconomic strata. So this wasn't just an urban phenomenon or an affluence phenomenon. Everybody said, yeah, this, you know, across, across the different, you know, socioeconomic strata. In fact, if you look at low-income people of color, that cohort, that was the group most likely to strongly agree with those personal and community well-being benefits. So that's something else that the arts do uh, also. Um, you know, they connect us. And, you know, these are fractious times in our communities, and it doesn't matter where you are on the political spectrum. Um, we need to be working together more. Our communities need to be working together to deal with the big issues. Uh, and, you know, again, the American public is telling us, hey, we know a solution, you know, the arts. Um, let me just jump ahead real quick and finish up uh, with this one. So what you're looking at here is a picture um, from Paris uh, at the Louvre. Um, 1912, bad news, the Mona Lisa got stolen. And those hooks are where the Mona Lisa where it's hanging. It took them two years to get the Mona Lisa back. But you know what? In the two years that the Mona Lisa was missing, more people went to see where it had been hanging, you know where this is going, than actually saw the painting itself in the previous 14 years. You know what? It's so easy for people to take for granted the work we do to improve our communities, to assume arts and culture will always be there, to assume that public support, that public funding will always be there. We've all got a job to do. We got to tell our story. We got to use these numbers and make sure everybody knows about the benefits of the arts to our communities, how they improve them socially, educationally, economically, and of course, you know, how they just improve our quality of life, how they improve our hearts, minds, and souls. And that's what you do. And so, again, I want to thank you for everything you do with the arts. Everything you do with the arts to advance the arts, present the arts, create opportunities for the arts is important, and you're important for doing it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. That's my email, my website. Uh, I don't know if we have time for some questions. Uh, looking uh, confident. Well, sure, why not? Who's got questions? Right there. Oh, arts turnaround story. Um, uh, well, you know, I can barely tell the uh, Chattanooga one, <laughs> you know, without, uh, uh, you know, choking up a little bit. Um, you know, I, there's so many incredible stories. Uh, you know, I was up in Maine recently, uh, and, you know, a small community in Maine, um, you know, uh, industry left, the fishing, uh, or the, uh, uh, the Navy left in that case, you know, left like 23 students in the school, and, you know, they invested in the arts, and they had a festival there, and they turned it, you know, uh, into, you know, uh, a two-week festival, and then it was like year-round events, and you know, it totally turned the community around. Artists came in, um, you know, it just become this total uh, uh, arts community. And so, you know, there's fabulous ones like that. Um, 
you know, it's just what they, you know, there's just great individual stories. You know, I'll tell you a personal arts turnaround story. Here's the answer. You know, this is arts and health. Um, three years ago, I had open heart surgery. You know, the, uh, the vegetarian who plays soccer twice a week, you know, was the first of his peers to go down to the table. And so there I was. Um, and, you know, uh, that's, that's a big surgery. Uh, and they get you up after a couple days, and they start walking you around. And, um, you know, I was in the halls, and, you know, I had my telemetry device and my tubes, and, you know, and, and there was art on the walls. And, and, you know, the shapes and the colors just, just drew me and attracted me to that. And I got to tell you, I could feel the healing touch, the healing power of the arts and the artist's hand, it was palpable. And I got to tell you, you know, you've heard me. I mean, I was, I've, been, I've been a shill for arts and healthcare for decades, but I'm telling you, it's real. And um, it, it was transformative, and it, it gave me hope that, uh, you know, I was going to get through that, and uh, I did. So I've got my own turnaround story, I guess. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so the first one, um, is there a correlation, you know, county research to, you know, healthier economic communities? You know, uh, I guess I would turn back to that Department of Agriculture NEA study that I talked about, which was, you know, big uh, and really a large undertaking. And again, where they found high preponderance of performing arts organizations correlates with um, innovative creative economy, uh, larger than usual. So, um, you know, there's, there are individual examples. Um, but you know, what it just shows is, uh, even if there aren't those correlations, that you know, the arts aren't some frill, some extra, you know, we're supporting you know, in prosperous times, but hard to justify when the economy's struggling. It's an industry, again and again, benefits that persist in good economies as well as bad economies. And so, um, I mean, that's, that's one way to, uh, to answer that. Uh, the second one, per, uh, engagement in the arts. Um, so that National Public Opinion Survey, 49% of the American public is personally involved as arts maker. Uh, and that's a, you know, we've been tracking that over the years. That's actually, you know, gone up, you know, fractionally. And so um, singing in a choir, painting, uh, you know, acting in a play, that type of thing. Uh, ballroom dancing, right? You know, there it is. So um, people doing that. Then I asked those folks who are personally involved in the arts, why? What benefits are you getting out of that? And I gave them a whole bunch of reasons. You know, well, it inspires me, you know, um, all these things. But first time around, I only let them pick one reason. And the reason that they picked most was it makes me feel creative. Isn't that great? You know, so people are engaging in the arts because it makes them feel creative. Um, people are... That's one way to answer it. Uh, also, um, you know, again, the, the piece where folks are engaging in the arts in different venues, you know, where more people are connecting with the arts in a non-arts venue than an arts venue, right? So I'll give you an example. Washington, D.C., three years ago, the Washington National Opera went out of business. Placido Domingo is its artistic director. Ticket sales down, revenues down, and that was it. And so you can say, well, all right, I guess Washingtonians just don't like opera anymore. Well, maybe, maybe not, because every summer at our baseball stadium, they do a live simulcast of an opera on the big screen, uh, and it's called Opera in the Outfield. And, you know, you could picnic on the grass, you could sit in the stands, the concessions are open. Really, wouldn't you just rather have a chili dog and a beer while you watch the opera sometimes, you know? 20,000 people show up to that, you know? Young people, families, the problem's not opera. Opera is just fine. It's the delivery mechanisms, and it's how people want to engage in the arts. People are looking for a more active kind of experience and a less passive experience. Um, you know, I was visiting a theater in South Carolina, this was a couple of years ago, uh, where they were doing an interesting um, experiment where you would sit in the audience, 
uh, and he would uh, put on a Bluetooth, dial up a phone number, and you would be able to listen to the stage manager call the show while you watch the play. I call it NASCAR for the arts. You know, you ever watch car racing on a Saturday? Well, you know, there's Rebecca's 23 car, and I can hear you talking to the pit crew and everything. It doesn't make me think I can drive a car 200 miles an hour, you know, even in a circle. Um, but it gives you this whole appreciation for what's going on. And, um, I, you know, I was at uh, a sculpture organization in Dallas not long ago, the Ray Nasher one, big outdoor, huge sculpture. They had um, the rotating exhibits, and they were packing up this big Calder exhibit, and it was headed to the UK. So, you know, these big giant guys, you know, lifting the big pieces of steel and putting it in the crates, and somebody with sort of the delicate petite hands, you know, putting the mobile in the styrofoam, trying not to break it. And, it was fascinating just to watch them put this thing away and get it ready for shipping. And the person was showing me around, she said, all right, nothing left to see here. And I said, well, hold on. This is the most interesting thing I've seen all day, you know? You get your $1,000 donors in here and put some microphones on these, you know, folks. Maybe have them drop a few of the F-bombs, you know, that would, that would be good. But um, they will love this because I got to tell you, um, it's amazing just to see how these shows go up and how these shows go down. Not only that, they have to wonder why this is a four and a half million dollar organization. The permanent collection's outside in the rain, you know? Why is this place so expensive? Well, when you see what it takes to do, um, you know, again, it gives you this whole different appreciation. Actually, before the Washington Opera went under, my friend of that uh, ran that organization, Michael, I was telling him about the Columbia, uh, about the South Carolina story of the theater. And so he started requiring his board of directors at the opera to watch at least one show sitting next to the stage manager backstage. Because he felt like, my board just doesn't understand why it takes 225 people to mount grand opera. Because when the budgets got tight, they'd say, well, just do it with 200 or something like that. And, boy, they put up holy heck in the beginning, he said. But eventually, you know, once they started doing it, now that's the only place anybody wants to watch an opera. You know, sitting back with a stage manager, it's so cool. So all that to say, you know, I came up with a theater training, and we learned all about the fourth wall. I think we need a more permeable, semi-permeable fourth wall now, because people are interested not just in the cultural product, but how it's happening and, you know, and, and the story behind that as well. It's still about artistic excellence and the best art possible, but it's, it's just making for a more active kind of experience. So, other questions? Thoughts? I have one. Yes. Do you have any advice on how to deal with the STEM movement? Yes, well, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, and of course, as most of you know by now, we got to squeeze the A in there for arts and make STEM to STEAM, right? Well, we're pushing this hard uh, in Capitol Hill, I'll tell you, in one place. There is now a STEAM caucus in Congress, and it's one of the fastest growing caucuses uh, because there's this appreciation now that we, well, it goes back to what we talked about with the importance of creativity. Go back to that ready to innovate report, how business leaders you know, yeah, you got to understand your science, your technology, your engineering, and math, but the high-paying, valuable jobs add the creativity ingredient, uh, and, you know, and that's the arts. Uh, so that's a real fundamental piece. So it's, it's telling that story as well. Pull in, pull in that creativity information. Pull in that creativity data. We have a lot of that information on the Americans for the Arts website. Uh, you can find, uh, you know, more about that as well. Yes? Do I play an instrument? Eh, you know, one uh, poorly and several others equally as well. Uh, you know, I get going on the guitar and a few things, but, uh, um, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, not so much anymore these days. One of these days I'll get back to it. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a dancer now. So. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, any other questions? Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is really great. Have a great rest of the conference. Thanks so much.